So welcome everybody, good afternoon. And we are very pleased to have you with us on the first session on, on a series called Crafting Your Career by India Biostreams, which uh, is the webinars by India Bioscience. And this series, Crafting Your Career, aims to address the various aspects uh, concerning concerning career development for science graduates and science professionals across the spectrum. In our first session today in this series, it's on an introduction to science careers and, ex and also um, exploring careers in particularly in research management. So today um, I'm Lakshmi, I'll be your host this afternoon. Uh, also joining me are Shreya and Smita, my colleagues at India Bioscience. Um, you, you'll be hearing from them shortly on, on uh, science, science careers, an introduction to science careers. We also are very honored to have uh, very uh, eminent guest speakers today join us. Uh, we, all, we have with us Ponari Gotipati. She is a consultant grants manager at the LV Prasad I Institute. We'll, um, we'll talk about her uh, more and we, she'll be presenting on careers and research management, her career journey. Specifically, we are also joined by Madan Kumar Anantakrishnan, who is a grants manager at DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance, who will be also talking the later part of the webinar on his career journey. So welcome, uh, a warm welcome to all our guest speakers and, and all our attendees um, who have joined us today uh, in, in quite great numbers. Um, for those of you who have joined us, uh, we would like to let you know that this uh, webinar is being simulcast on YouTube live via YouTube live stream. You'll see a link to that, but in case you're not able to um, access this link, you can always access it from our homepage on the India Bioscience website, www.indiabioscience.org. For those of you who are joining us via Zoom, I'm going to uh, share this link via the chat window. Uh, with you. So in case you're, you're not able to join us for any reason, or if you're having any audio visual issues, audio video issues, uh, please feel free to switch over to this simulcast link where you can view this webinar as well. Okay, so uh, let's spend just a very brief uh, time in uh, going over a few housekeeping instructions. This will help you with your experience and interact with us better as we go along. So if you have a web app version of Zoom, your screen is going to look like this. Uh, that's shared on my screen right now. But if you have a downloaded app, a desktop version, your screen will be different, but I'll demonstrate some features will be that will be the same. So in the bottom right, you'll see audio settings, you can test your audio video uh, settings using that. Um, you might be needing it during the Q&A part where we would, uh, where you could interact with the speakers live. Um, you will also have these three icons, as you can see, you will have a raise hand icon and that's what you would uh, click on. When it turns greens, that's the indication that you wanna ask a question to the speakers. We however request that you save your questions uh, in the designated Q&A, uh, section of the webinar uh, where the speakers, the floor will open for Q&A. Uh, in, in, the, in, in the meantime, if you do have burning questions, uh, you can always type those questions in what's called the Q&A box. When you click on that, that opens. And you can type in your questions. You have the option of also sending your questions anonymously if you wish to. And uh, our team here will take up these questions um, and, 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 and place it in front of the, uh, front of the speakers. Okay, so we also have, you also have what's called a chat window here. You will not be able to uh, type into that chat window to interact with us, but the chat window is uh, uh, an avenue through which we will share relevant links with you pertinent to the webinar, like the li simulcast link that I have just shared. Uh, so keep on the lookout for those of you who are joining us via YouTube. There's uh, my colleague Manjula is moderating uh, on YouTube and she'll be sharing the links with you. Okay, so without further ado, um, before we get started, just one thing we would love to get to know you. So let's start by let's start with a small audience poll, uh, which I will I will launch any moment now. So if you do see a, an audience poll launched on your screen, please take a moment to let us know a little bit about yourself, so we know who is joining us and a little bit about what what your thoughts are on the next steps in your career ahead. So we'll give about 30 seconds for this poll.
So we'll end this poll in about five seconds. So let me share the results. Uh, you'll be seeing the results of this poll. If you're watching us on YouTube, you might not be able to see the results, but I'll, I'll uh, share the results. Most of you, 37% of you are master's students. 27% uh, of you are undergraduates. We have 18% PhD students, 7% postdoctoral fellow. We also have some faculty join us. 4% of you are faculties. And 3% of you are science professionals um, across the spectrum. And we also have 4% uh, of you who are in none of these categories. So welcome to all of you, and, and we hope that this would be of value to you. Okay, so le what are your responses on the next step and top career choices? And uh, uh, we see 82% of you would like to be researchers, 43% of you would like to be educators, and 11% of you do want to be grants managers. Uh, you have some good uh, resource people here today in this webinar for that. And 34% uh, of you are science communicators. 4% uh, of you want to be intellectual property advisors, some core facility managers, science policy advisors, entrepreneurs, business developments. And so uh, we, we are so happy that we have a very uh, broad and an open-minded audience. So uh, without further ado, I would like to pass this uh, forum on to my colleague Smita, who will talk to you a little bit about what is India Bioscience to begin with and, and some of our efforts in the space of careers. Smita. Thank you, Lakshmi. Am I audible and my slide uh, visible? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. A warm welcome. Uh, you know, over last one and a half years or so, ever since we started the career workshops, uh, we've been actually going to different locations across the country uh, in person and have been interacting with, uh, with uh, you know, audience like you all in person. Uh, so it's the first time that we have come online where the audience is not right in front of us. So that, that part is something that we will definitely miss. Uh, but we really hope that uh, this session and the following sessions of the series would be something that uh, all of you would benefit tremendously. So before we actually get into talking about careers, I thought it would be a good idea to quickly talk about, sorry, it, it, it's, it's a good idea to, to very quickly talk about uh, India Bioscience, who we are and what we do. So very quickly, India Bioscience started uh, about little more than a decade ago over a dinner, a dinner conversation. And from there to what we are today, uh, there's been a huge uh, change. Uh, but yes, our broad mandates uh, have remained more or less the same, just that the activities have grown uh, drastically. So uh, if I talk about the mandates of India Bioscience, we work around networking, communication, skill development, what brings us here today, uh, education and data and policy. So in the networking space, we have been trying to create these communities of uh, young researchers uh, who, who are either in their early careers in India or who are looking to develop or get into the Indian science in the Indian research space. So for that, uh, our flagship meeting, Young Investigators meeting has been going on. And every year we have gone to a different location, as you can see from the picture on the left, we have gone to different locations across the, across the country. And these have been, you know, great meetings. We also started uh, regional meetings uh, about two years uh, back. So we, in order to create local regional networks of young investigators and other science professionals. Uh, moving on, uh, I guess I would not take very long because there's a lot uh, to talk about today. Uh, so I would not spend a lot of time talking about India Bioscience. Communication is another big vertical that we have at India Bioscience and uh, we, we do most of our communication through our website called www.indiabioscience.org. And the face of this website kind of changes every second or third day because a new article uh, goes up on the website or a new resource or, you know, uh, it's a pretty dynamic website. Uh, other than that, we have our monthly newsletter. We are very active on social media. We have discussion forums on the website. 
We regularly put out relevant jobs grants, even on the website uh, through our uh, web webinar uh, channel, India BioStreams, what brings us here today. Uh, we, we have been uh, putting out very interesting webinars uh, and India BioSpeaks is our podcast channel and the first series is on careers. So uh, moving on, I guess I would just spend a minute talking about our skill building vertical creating an awareness and popularize different science skills that are available to the young science graduates. Number of careers in science talk workshops. We early this year we brought out this book called Disha, a career resource book for life science students, uh, which is again available uh, freely to download from the website. Uh, this book was written by Dr. Somit Gobel. Uh, so I would request you all to please uh, go and download this book, uh, post this uh, webinar, and and uh, there are a lot of career resources all freely available on India Bioscience website. To please, so please, please feel free to download it from the website. There are a large number of talks, podcasts under the India Biospeaks banner and uh, books available. Uh, so moving on, uh, we have been doing a lot of workshops. Uh, as I said in, my, in the very beginning, crafting your career workshop is something that uh, three of us, uh, Shreya, Lakshmi and myself, developed in-house, which talks use tools one one can use in order to you know craft the career successfully and beautifully. So uh, that's the that's what this piece is also going to touch upon various modules of uh, CY's workshop that has been developed. We have also been doing grants writing workshops either independently or in association. We just as a condition with other organizations. We very recently finished the uh, uh, the grants writing workshop with EMBO and the recording of that is available again on the India Bioscience uh, website. So those of you who could not attend can uh, you know benefit from the recording. We have done uh, scientific writing, journalism workshops, science administration and management workshops in association with other organizations uh, in India. Uh, so again, very quickly, I guess I thought since we are talking about careers, it's very uh, important to share what, what it means. What is the difference between a career and a job and how do we perceive it? Shreya is going to be talking more about it, but I just thought I'll share that, you know, it's not just one single path. Uh, the, the degree that we earn, any degree that we earn, uh, equips us with lots of different skill sets that we must be aware of. And these skill sets can be actually applied in various different paths, not just a one path. So that's that's the message I wanted to give. Uh, and uh, I'm again sure you all would agree that this degree allows us to open multiple, you know, multiple locks that, that are in front of us. It's just that we need to work to figure out which lock to unlock. So uh, there are, you know, during this journey, I guess when the speakers share, start sharing their journeys, they would also share. In fact, even for me, there are there were crossroads in, in this journey that where, which way do you go, this way or that way or some other way. But, but, but if you remain courageous, if you remain decisive and, you know, align yourself really well, I'm sure that at the end of it, unlocking that path that gives you happiness and success is not a difficult task. So uh, with that, very quickly, I'll give you an overview of uh, this particular series that we have planned out. Uh, each of these sessions will be talking about, uh, India Bioscience team will be talking about the various modules of crafting your career. Today's science careers, we'll be then talking of skills, interest, values, you know, how do you research career options, 
the very importance of networking, building strong networks, uh, presenting your best self, role models, mentors, and much more. Uh, and we, are, we will be happy to answer uh, questions. And our guest speakers, we, we have tried to bring them from who, who all have been uh, who all have a degree in science, but they all have carved their uh, niche in various different career paths. So they will be sharing their own journeys, their experiences, and uh, more about that particular path. So I'm sure that each one of you would uh, benefit out of this particular uh, series. Please feel free to ask your questions today or even later. We are more than happy to engage with all of you. Uh, and with that, again, it's a very, very uh, favorite quote of mine that uh, from Barbara McClintock, which says that I was just so interested in what I was doing. I could hardly wait to get up in the morning and get at it. One of my friends, a geneticist said that I was a child because only children can't wait to get up in the morning to get at what they want to do. So be a child and I hope you all would enjoy your career journeys. Thank you. Over to you, Lakshmi. Thank you, Smita. We will have a, a presentation on, on science careers by Shreya now. And, uh, uh, she has a colleague, she or colleague of mine at India Bioscience. She's the program manager, science communication, and uh, she'll be presenting. Over to you, Shreya. Thank you, Lakshmi. I hope I'm audible now. Hi. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many of you here today. And before we move on to our discussion of research management with our special guest today, we thought we'd take a little time to step back a little and ask some more fundamental questions. Like today in the 21st century, what does a career path even mean? Or what is a science career? Or how do you go about this whole process of planning your career development? Or how do you even begin to figure out which of all the many career options out there is the right one for you? So many of us have a picture of career development that looks something like this, that start somewhere, uh, step by step, you make progress until you reach the top somewhere and that's when you're successful. Some of us may have a slightly different picture as well. Like when I was doing my PhD, I thought, this is what career progression looks like. You do your PhD, you do your postdoc, you apply to a bunch of faculty positions until you reach that holy grail of a tenured professorship. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, in the real world, instead of this neat set of stairs, you are more likely to have something that looks like this. And instead of this simple straightforward ladder, you are more likely to have something that looks like this. So if you look at this, these pictures, I think what jumps to mind immediately is that it's a lot there, The picture is not empty here. There are a lot of options. But that is the good thing about this, that there are a lot of options. So returning to that question, what are schedules? In my opinion, the answer is pretty simple. Science schedules are careers that involve science. So a scientist or a researcher or an academician is obviously one such career. But so are science administrators, science communicators, science policy makers, initial property specialists, educators, not to mention all the industry positions out there, R&D, uh, technical writing, uh, business development. All of these are science careers. Why? Because all of these are careers that require a thorough understanding of scientific principles and their application. So they're all science careers. So in today, in the year 2020, what does a career path look like usually? So for one thing, for most of us, uh, instead of joining one organization and working there for the entirety of your career, what most of you are likely to have is a succession of different job roles in different places throughout your career. Secondly, 
it's no longer possible to separate out the education and the work part of your career. If that once you get a degree, you stop learning. Instead, what you have to do, what most of us have to do is to embrace lifelong learning. The workplaces of today are constantly changing. So what's required of somebody in a job role today is very different from what was required for somebody in that same position 10 years ago. And it's going to be, again, very different 10 years from now. So flexibility is very, very important in a scenario like this. Also, uh, earlier, many organizations used to have what's called a pyramidal structure. So there used to be one guy at the top. There would be people working under him or her. And there would be more people working below them. And progression basically meant walking up this pyramid through promotions. But nowadays, more organizations have what is called a horizontal structure. So the power is a lot more distributed. And this means that for making progress, you don't necessarily need to move up. You can also move horizontally within organizations. And there's this whole new class of jobs where you are essentially employed by yourself. And it's not your job title or your position that indicates your success, but the whole body of work, your portfolio that you have created over a span of time. And what the upshot of all of these points is, is that this idea that I am to get a job and I'm going to work at it for 30 years or 40 years until I retire at the age of 60. And I guess our parents' generation or the generations before that uh, often had this idea. But today, that idea may no longer be viable. So in the, this sort of crazy, dynamic, continuously changing scenario, what do you do, right? How do you make sense of this clear path? So the first step, it always begins with you. You need to understand who you are, what is it that you need or require from your career, and what is it that you're willing to offer in return? Once you have done that step, the next step becomes easy, which is to research career or get as much information as possible about as many career paths out there and make sure that that information is accurate and relevant. Once you've done this uh, and you have figured out that these are a few career options I am interested in, next you find out what skills those paths required and you build those either through acquiring additional education or by working at different jobs. And then when we come to this whole navigating the job application process, there uh, first, you need to understand what employers are looking for. Second, when you're doing all the process of interviews, CVs, resumes, cover letters, you, you need to keep in mind how to present yourself in the best possible way, how to present yourself such that your unique qualities are immediately apparent to the people who are hiring. Network, it's impossible to overemphasize the importance of your network, no matter what career path you choose, uh, your network is always going to come in useful and we'll have a whole session dedicated to this later in the series. And getting a job is only the first step. Once you have got a job, you need to figure out how to be a professional at that job, how to maintain a sense of ethics, sense of work ethics. And this whole process, when you are moving through this process, it's impossible to do this completely on your own. You need people on your side. You need people you can look up to, people who can motivate you, people who can inspire you, maybe people you can go to when you're in trouble or when you need advice or when you're confused. So this part often gets overlooked or neglected when it comes to discussions on career development, but mentors and role models play a very, very important role in your career development. So today, out of all these steps, we are only going to be talking about this first one, which is about learning to know yourself, learning to assess yourself. And as we all know, this is easier said than done. So how do you even begin something like this? So we, were, we are going to suggest uh, three simple steps, uh, three aspects from which you can approach this. So you look at yourself from the point of view of your skills, your interests, and your values. So we'll start with skills. What are skills? Skills are basically the things that you're good at. So these can be uh, things that you are talents that you are born with, 
or more often they're usually abilities that you acquire during your education or during while you're doing different jobs and skills are important because skills are your tools when there's a job to be done skills are the tools that are going to allow you to do that job and when you're figuring out what your skill set is you need to keep in mind not only what you're good at but also what you'd like to be good at now as smita said we have been doing this workshop in various parts of the country and we often go there and we pose this question to students like hey what are your top skills and we tend to get a certain type of answer and it's understandable right if somebody asks you hey what are your skills obviously your mind jumps to the techniques that you have learned in the lab or uh, your programming skills or something like some technical skill and while technical skills are important they are not the only kind of skill you have nor are they the most important kind of skill you have there are also this whole other category of transferable skills of soft skills if you have done a research project at any point in your life if you have let's say let's say if you have written a scientific paper or a report or a review you have reading and research skills you know how to analyze data you know how to communicate your results you know how to manage a project how to break it down into manageable smaller chunks and tasks and set up a timeline or things like that you probably also have people skills your mentor your lab mates your batch mates even your family and friends you have been interacting with them and balancing these relationships and that gives you people skills that can be useful in any sort of workplace and finally not all the skills that you gain have to come from your work or your lab any creative pursuit that you may have uh, pursued outside of your work or your lab you will be surprised at how often they come in handy so yeah your only skill is not by betting okay that's enough about skills what about interests interests are things that you have fun doing that you feel a sense of curiosity about let's say you are interested in history for example or you're interested in photography or interested in traveling why are these important because they are the things that are going to keep you going when things are going to get hard and believe me some point in your long career things are going to get difficult and at that point your strong interest your passion that is what is going to get you out of bed and get you to show up day after day so another thing to keep in mind here is that not everything you are interested in will form a part of your job or your career some of them will remain as hobbies some of them you'll maybe do on the weekends uh, or as a side project but what's important is that whatever career path you choose make sure that there are some elements in it some aspects of it that arouse that sense of interest in you because that's going to come in very useful later so if skills are the things that you're good at interests are the things that you have fun doing what are values values are the most important of all because values are what give you purpose they are what give allow you to derive a sense of satisfaction or meaning from your work so they provide you a sense of direction and values are different for every single person so you have to ask yourself what is most important for me in my job like uh do i need a job that will help me benefit society say or do i need to do a job where i can support my family where or where i receive some recognition or it's there is no right or wrong answer here it's going to be completely up to you what your answers are but you need to know them so when you have done this exercise when you have a list of your skills your interests and your values and i would like to emphasize here that do not do this exercise in your mind take a piece of paper and actually write down these are my skills these are my interests these are my values and when you have done that what you will have is a document that gives you your unique profile and this is going to come in handy in all the next steps whenever you are speaking to somebody from a career you are interested in whenever you are searching online for a job you are interested in all of these cases you match it up against this document about your unique profile and that is going to tell you whether or not this is a good match for you also this is not an exercise that you do once in your lifetime and then forget your profile today is not going to be the same as your profile 6 months from now or 1 year from now or 2 years from now or it's 
going to you are a person who's constantly changing and your profile is constantly going to be changing so it's important that this be an iterative process that you come back to this exercise again and again that you see hey this has changed or this has not changed and this is who i am today and these are the decisions that i'm going to make tomorrow right so just to sum this part up there are many many career paths and they're constantly changing so what's important is that you remain flexible you broaden your interests you keep your options open and you keep learning and while you're doing this look inside and try to tailor your career to your own unique combination of skills interests and values so we are going to do another uh, little audience poll now and you will see it appear on your screens those of you who are on zoom right now and i don't want you to spend a lot of time thinking about these answers uh, you'll be doing this exercise many times over and over again in your life so pick the answers that seem correct to you at this moment so we'll give you one more uh, another say 30 seconds for this and then i'm going to read out the answers Uh, for our viewers on youtube i think uh, a google form will be shared with you okay so another 5 seconds maybe and then we'll close this poll okay so we'll look at the results now okay so the skill that most of you believe in which of the following categories do you believe you are most skilled so most of you believe you are most skilled in reading and research so that's 38% 16% of you also think you have analytical skills 12% uh, believe you have communication skills 14% of you uh, have mentioned creativity people management project management the category in which most of you would like to build more skills is analytical ability followed by reading and research at 18% uh, communication at 23% creativity at 12% people management and project management at 11 and 8% uh, respectively a lot of you 60% of you are very interested in traveling uh, i think that's followed by 33% of you are interested in meeting new people 30% in photography 24% in creating visual art 19% in working with computers 16% engaging in activism 32% creative writing and for 8% of you i am afraid your interests were not listed here but we will be happy to expand this list in the future okay and for 58% of you it's very important that uh, i'm sorry i guess i lost the results yeah for 58% of you it's very important that your work is intellectually challenging and uh, more 40% of you would like to work in teams with others 54% of you think work life balance is very important and that's great to see uh, 43% of you are interested in using your creative skills and so we have a very even spread of interests and values here and that's very interesting to see and i'm sure all of you will make your paths in some really unique career paths and niches for yourself so i'll hand it back to you lakshmi thank you shreya it was a wonderful presentation um, so we will take a few questions audiences have shared their questions with with us um so i will direct it to you and and smita respectively okay so Hmm. So one of the questions from an anonymous attendee is how would you what would you suggest the ways to go about finding mentors who can guide us through career transition phases Smita would you like to take this question Okay uh, great question I guess uh, again uh, mentors mentors play a really really huge role and uh, 
it's it's from the very beginning from the very start you know your school teacher can be your mentor or your undergrad post grad or as you move along it can be anyone and it's not necessary that it's only your educators or your teachers have to be your mentors it can even be some family member or you know with whom your uh, with whom your ideologies match and you think that this person can give you some really great advice or even someone unknown in your network it's just that you have to keep that relationship very very professional and maintain that relationship in a way that this person kind of travels this career journey along with you and at every step wherever you need the advice you can reach out to this person so keep an eye open and see that you can find your mentor anywhere uh, during this journey thanks thank you smita uh, muskan gupta asks is it always necessary that our interests resonate with the field in which we work shreya hi that's a really good question uh, muskan so as i said it's uh, unlikely that all of your interests are always going to play a role in the career path you choose but if you find if you are find yourself in a position where no aspect of the job interests you that is not a very pleasant position to be in so in any job there's always going to be some parts that you enjoy and that interest you more than the other parts and it's important to strike that balance so that that part outweighs the parts that may be you find slightly boring and uh, it's also important that sometimes we get very fixed ideas in our heads that these are the things i'm interested in these are the things i'm not interested in and this is how things are going to be but some very often when you explore a little out of your comfort zone look at other things that you may never have thought you would be interested in you may find that you are interested in them so two steps one is make sure that the job you are starting in has some aspects that interest you and two try to actively broaden your basically repertoire of interests thanks shreya here's a question for you smita so an anonymous attendee asks so in case my career has some gap years um how does that affect my career opportunities in academics or industries or uh, or any other uh, oppor- opportunities okay okay uh, another very relevant question uh, many of us have had career breaks or gaps or for various uh, you know multiple reasons but as long as during that break period you are keeping a track of what's happening in the field maybe it's not possible to completely keep a track but as far as possible keep a track and you are in touch with your mentors and you know you've you've kind of maintained your network active it's much easier to come back i also agree that for many roles especially in academia where age at times becomes a limiting factor at that point it can be a little difficult to get back to exactly the role that you are looking for but that that's also talking about and people are trying to work that uh, uh, as well uh, and as long as your skills and you showcase that you bring in the right skills that I'm sure you know coming back is not going to be that difficult. Thank you, Smita. And here's one more question. We'll take maybe one and one more, one other. Uh, Nidhi Saikedar asks, uh, maybe Smita can answer this. How do I understand the job requirements of a recruiter? Okay, that's a question. Actually, Lakshmi uh, should be answering. Uh, so in 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 our next podcast uh, from india bio speaks we are going to be talking about this in much detail so uh, is it okay if i leave that right here just to maintain that curiosity lakshmi what do you suggest else i'll answer it absolutely i mean uh, you should you should listen to our next podcast nidhi uh, and yes. and we would love you to listen to that we'll be talking about it at length uh, length yes. and uh, we'll take one last question uh, which is i am an undergraduate student 
uh, an anonymous attendee says, and I, I know I want to do a PhD, but I do not know about the career, careers outside academia, which provide job security and a good financial backing. How do I go about that? Uh, so maybe uh, Smita can take that up, but I, I also want to add that our speakers are also going to be addressing uh, a good part of this of, of this problem. Smita? Yeah, I guess uh, all I, I would suggest at this point is that go ahead, do your PhD, you know, if that's your dream, uh, fulfill that dream, just keep your eyes open. I'm sure, you know, it's still a long way to go. And by that time, uh, what Shreya just spoke about, it, Keep an eye on your own uh, skills, interests, and uh, your values, and accordingly develop. In terms of knowing the various career paths, uh, there's a lot of information out there on the internet. You can also go to our website and just download Disha, this book uh, called Disha. We have also shared the link. Maybe we can share the link for Disha, uh, Disha again. That talks at length about various career possibilities, uh, uh, and, and the kind of skills that's needed for each of these possibilities. So I'm sure a lot of your questions will be answered by going through the book. And if at hello at indiabioscience.org. Okay, so we, with that, we end the first in part of our webinar. We will now have a couple of presentations by our guest speakers. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Ponari Gotipati, uh, who will be speaking uh, to us next about her career journey in research management. Uh, Ponari is a, is a science education and an outreach consultant, currently consulting for LV Prasad I Institute Hyderabad. Uh, she's a grants manager. She co-leads this uh, incredible project called Superheroes Against Superbugs. It's a public engagement initiative on antibiotic resistance. She's trained in molecular biology with, and she has a PhD from the University of Sheffield. And she also has a postdoc from the University of Oxford. And she was also previously at the DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance. Ponari, it's uh, over to you on, on your presentation on research management. Okay. Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you, India Bioscience, for making me a part of this uh, important initiative. I truly appreciate the work you're doing in uh, uh, popularizing non-academic science careers. And I also really, really like the name you've given to this initiative, Crafting Your Career. Carefully and skillfully build your career over time. I think it's a very apt name. So uh, I think I'll take on from where uh, Shreya left off in the previous uh, uh, session. So I think it is very important for each of us to actually introspect on what career means to us and what is important to us in our careers. And uh, personally for me, I think what motivates me is a sense of accomplishment, knowing that what I do uh, makes a difference even to a small extent. And what gives me job satisfaction is knowing that the organization values my contributions. So um, personally, I'm at a very uh, a happy space in my career right now uh, because of these two factors. And also because I think that I'm able to put my skills and experience to the best use. And uh, uh, also I'm doing what I enjoy doing. So before i start talking about research management i think i will spend a, a little while a few minutes talking about my journey so far so uh, as shreya pointed out i was one of those people you know during undergraduation i thought my career path was set uh, you know i thought uh, i would do a masters a phd a postdoc and then i knew that i would uh, you know retire a professor so, and then everything happened in quick succession as well. I did a master's and PhD from University of Sheffield and then a postdoc uh, from University of Oxford. Actually did well um, in my academic career. I published well, and I also thoroughly enjoyed uh, being at bench and doing research. And uh, the vibrant and intellectual environment at Oxford was also truly inspiring. And uh, it is something that I really hold very dear. But that was, also the time when I realized that academic career was not for me. So the career progression in academia and the pressures that came with it were something that did not appeal to me at all. 
So when I decided to return to India after my postdoc, that was also the time I took a conscious decision to step out of academia and try something else. And um, uh, research management actually just happened. Uh, it was not something that I planned to do at all. There was a job opportunity available at India Alliance. And uh, you know the thing that interested me most about that uh, job opportunity was that it was based in Hyderabad, where my family was. And uh, being in UK, I also um, knew of the good work that the Wellcome Trust does and the mandate of India Alliance to bring about a change in the funding scenario in the country uh, interested me. I thought maybe this would be a way to contribute to science in the country. And uh, I thought, okay, let me give this a go. If it works, fine. If it doesn't, then I'll try something else. And that's how my first job in research management happened. And the good thing with uh, my time at India Alliance was that, you know, the organization was very young and we were a very small team. So we got to do a lot of things uh, other than grants management as well. Like we participated in science and communication workshops, website management, contributing to annual reports, and also contributing to setting up policies and processes in the organization. So it was um, a great platform for skill building. And I'm truly thankful for my time at India Alliance. Uh, after India Alliance, again, I took a conscious decision uh, to take a career break because of personal reasons. But that was also the time when I ventured into other things that interest me, science education and science outreach uh, through some volunteering and uh, a consultancy job. And again, these are things that I really, really enjoy doing. So last year, when I decided to return to research management again, I made a conscious decision again to uh, stay a consultant so that I can also continue to do other things that also interest me. So though I did not realize it uh, or I did not know it at the time, now when I look, look back at my career trajectory, I think uh, what I realize is that actually one thing led to another. My training in academia helped me with my position in research management at India Alliance. And my experiences at India Alliance uh, actually shaped everything else that I've done and I have been doing uh, uh, henceforth. Um, so this is something that uh, uh, I did not realize at the time, but this is what has happened. And so I think if I have to sum up my career trajectory in one statement, I think it would be this, that I am not a product of my circumstances, but I am actually a product of my decisions. Um, even at times when I did not know what to do and when it felt like I was actually uh, 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 just following my heart, I think I did it the smart way. So I think it's important to carefully weigh your options and align it with your interests as Shreya so nicely put, and also what matters to you at that point in your life and then take a call based on that. And once you've made the choice, uh, give in your best and I'm sure uh, whatever you decide to do, you will do well. And another thing that I want to say here is not to be afraid to experiment and to try something new. Because even if you realize that that is not what you would like to continue doing, uh, those experiences will never be wasted. Uh, those experiences will definitely help you no matter what else you decide to do in life later on. So that would be my advice to all of you. And now moving on to the actual topic of the uh, uh, talk today, research management. So simply put, research management is all administrative and operational functions dealing with management of research. And why is research management important? Because um, science is going global and with increasing complexity and breadth of research portfolios, it becomes important that you have broad yet specialist skills and knowledge to facilitate science. And you know, uh, developing and sustaining research portfolios for organizations is difficult. But even after you get funding, um, you know, it becomes uh, there are you have to fulfill a range of obligations. The funding is very tightly audited. You have some very tight milestones and deliverables, um, and uh, the research itself is uh, uh, heavily audited and very uh, rigorously monitored. So, you know, that is where we step in and that is where research managers step in to kind of facilitate all of this and to make it easy for organizations. Um, so here I've actually listed out a few responsibilities of research managers. 
Um, these include pre and post award management, contractual arrangements, regulatory affairs, IP and technology transfer, business development, uh, spin out companies, and for um, you know, uh, teaching hospitals and teaching institutions, uh, administration of training and capacity building activities related to research could also fall under the ambit of research management. I've also listed out a few example roles here. Uh, please don't take them on face value. They may not actually be called those. Those titles are just uh, some examples that I've given. Um, so grants managers and grants advisors are people you will find in funding agencies and also in institutions. Uh, they mostly deal with pre and post award management. Um, project coordinators are people who deal with projects that have multiple sites like public health projects and that sort of a thing. Program managers, um, these are the people that deal with uh, like, you know, big ticket, uh, multi-institutional, multinational, large consortia uh, kind of programs for which you would need someone to sort of manage the whole thing. Um, clinical research coordinators as a name itself suggests uh, uh, projects involving human clinical trials. And then the rest of these things, you won't actually find uh, these roles in many institutions in India, even though in uh, Western countries, these are very common. Uh, most institutions actually work with uh, 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 consultancy, uh, uh, consultancy firms that help them with these specific aspects, except for a few very uh, few institutions. And so these consultancy firms might be places where you could find some of these positions available. And with focus on innovation in the country nowadays, and with increasing number of incubators that are coming up across the country, um, those are again some places where some of these roles could become available. Uh, before I talk about what I do at LV Prasad, I just will give you a brief introduction to the organization because many of you might not be aware. Um, so. LV Prasad Eye Institute uh, is based in Hyderabad. It started in 1987 with the mission to provide equitable and quality eye care to uh, people of all sections of the society. It started off as one hospital, but now we have 212 centers with about 186 primary eye care centers in remote uh, rural and tribal areas and also one international center in Liberia. As you can see, research forms an integral part of operations at LV Prasad, and the research portfolio uh, includes clinical research, basic research, that is immunology, microbiology, genetics and genomics, stem cell biology, um, biophysics, biooptics, um, public health. They've done some pioneering work uh, in the public health sphere uh, for eye health in the country. Uh, we also have a bioengineering department, an innovation center, and a small incubator. So it's a very interesting research portfolio, and most of our funding comes from national and international grants, fellowships, as well as donations. So when I was hired last year at LV Prasad as a grants manager, my main responsibility was to set up a central grants office and to streamline the grants processes in the organization. And as part of this, I have actually proposed to set up an online grant management portal uh, and the institution uh, welcomed this idea with open arms. And I now have a IRMI grant, which is a research management grant to carry forward this. I'm sure Madan will talk more about uh, IRMI initiative. So I, will just, I would just like to say here that I'm very thankful for this funding opportunity. So uh, what I do at LV Prasad as a grants manager can be divided into pre-award processes and post-award processes. Pre-award processes involve horizon scanning for funding opportunities, helping researchers identify right funding for their career stage, and also based on um, you know what on the research on the science that they want to do. Um, grants writing, helping with applications, liaising with funding agencies for queries, and the application process itself, um, ensuring that all checks are done, that everything is being submitted um, the way it should be so that quality applications go out from the institution. So uh, the post-award uh, processes involve uh, uh, managing funds, of course, timely uh, submission of reports, international collaborations. Um, this comes in uh, both in the pre-award and post-award because most of these bilateral programs and uh, bilateral funding actually requires um, the very complicated application processes. So I uh, liaise with my counterpart in the foreign university uh, to ensure that uh, you know, everything happens um, on time and also quality application goes out. 
uh, liaising with the uh, PIs, finance and admin is a very important part of my job. And I also deal with collaboration agreements, both subcontracts and memorandum of understandings and things like that. Um, now, regulatory affairs and patents, I don't deal with on a day to day basis, but I step in when my help is required. So as you can see here, there is scope here for like varied skill sets from academia to also administrative. Most of the post award processes require administrative skills and my science training and my academic training uh, comes in play for pre award processes when I'm dealing with applications. Uh, so what are the key skills that are required for you to become an effective research manager? I would say it would be a combination of professional skills, personal attributes, and also an enabling environment, which is also very, very crucial. Coming to skills, um, having a natural flair of working with people, attention to detail, good organizational and communication skills are crucial. Um, willingness to learn new areas is definitely um, important. And having a broad-based understanding of science and the scientific ecosystem in the country will definitely help you to increase the funding portfolio of your organization. Um, ability to comprehend complex information, this is something that academia already trains us for. And because ours is a facilitatory role and we are liaising with varied kinds of people, negotiation skills also become important and numeracy skills when we are dealing with, um, you know, funding and uh, money. So um, as with any job, there are things that I like about my job and there are things that I don't like as much. What I like the most about my current position is uh, the organization that I'm actually working for. Uh, LV Prasada Institute, actually 50% of the patients that come to this institution get free treatment, irrespective of how complex the procedure is. So the ethos of the organization uh, really connect uh, with me and, you know, I, it's a very, it's very fulfilling to work for an organization like that. Uh, and interacting with scientists and facilitating science is something that I enjoy doing a lot. Being a part of academia while not having to face the rigors and the uh, pressures of a career in academia, I think is what, uh, uh, what I like most about this position. And uh, I've already talked about uh, best use of my skills and uh, accomplishment uh, in the previous section. So what I don't like as much is definitely financial reports because I'm not good with numbers at all. So that is why I take my time with these reports and it also helps that I have a good eye for detail. So, and the administrative uh, side of research management could definitely uh, get mundane and repetitive. That is why I'm always looking out for uh, uh, ways to make it more interesting, both within and also outside of the job, like I said, uh, by taking on different projects as well. Um, so what are the main challenges of a career in research management? At institute level, I would say uh, the most, uh, uh, one of the challenges is uh, bringing about change is hard, you know, especially the older the institution, uh, you know, the harder it becomes to change anything there. And you are there to streamline the processes, which means that you have to bring in some sort of change. So, uh, so the key to that is winning the trust, uh, trust of people, and then, Eventually, they will realize that you are there to make their life easy and they will come along, but it is important that you win their trust and you take them along in this journey. Uh, the second challenge is that most government funding agencies actually do not recognize this role. So when you want to talk to them about something, they're very reluctant and they always say, no, I'll only talk to the PI. Uh, but actually building that personal rapport with them definitely helps over time and that uh, helps you in uh, overcoming that challenge. Um, another challenge uh, in an institutional role is um, respecting boundaries because, you know, um, while, you're in, while you are in a facilitatory role, uh, you have to remember that, you know, it is their science and it is their idea. So you don't want to be too overbearing with your inputs and, you know, your suggestions. You have to give them uh, while you help them improve their application. And secondly, also, uh, it could be the other way around also that when you're trying to help them and when you're trying to make their life easy, you should also ensure that due protocols are followed. So sometimes it could be a tight walk. Um, and then complexity of ethical issues and legal issues when you're dealing with regulatory affairs and contracts uh, could also be uh, daunting. 
um, that just, uh, you know, this is just something that you, that just gets better with time. With respect to the field itself, I would say the main challenge is lack of professional training. And uh, one of the other challenges is not having a clear career progression, because this is a relatively new field in the country. These roles are just cropping up now. And therefore, there is no, you know, there is no clear career progression set for a role like this. But I think that could also be exciting for some people, because then, you know, you get the chance to shape the career the way you want it to. And um, uh, the main lessons learned for me, uh, this is something that I tell everybody that, you know, uh, managing processes are easy, but managing people is hard, especially when you're in a facilitatory role, when you have to liaise with people, it becomes very important that the focus stays on people and the processes will take care of themselves. And uh, Shreya already pointed this out, but it is very, very important to remain open to learning. Every day you will learn something new in this role and every person that you meet also has something to teach you. So it's very, very important that you remain open and uh, you take it all in good spirits. And finally, yeah, be flexible and adapt to the needs of the organization. And even in your career itself, it, it is very, very important that you remain flexible to experiment, to try out new things. And then, you know, I'm sure the journey would be rewarding. So on that note, I would like to thank uh, uh, India Bioscience once again. And uh, these are my uh, social media handles and my email address if any of you want to connect with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ponari. Uh, thank you for sharing your journey and through your journey and giving us a comprehensive overview of the uh, research management ecosystem and also spelling out the challenges and the various opportunities. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sure there are a lot of questions, but before we open the questions to open the floor to questions, we would like to hear from Madan for providing another, his point of view on the research management ecosystem. Uh, so Madan, here is joining us from uh, Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance. And he actually did a PhD in structure biology from European Molecular Biology Laboratory. And he joined India Alliance as a grants advisor in 2013. But he not only does uh, grants advising um, with India Alliance, but also is involved in science communication training activities. And also in the pilot phase of ERMI, which uh, Ponari just mentioned, which is the India Research Management Initiative. Uh, uh, which is aiming to strengthen research ecosystem in India. Uh, and he also as a grants advisor, he served as a secretary to India's, uh, India Alliance's Fellowship Selection Committee. Uh, he assumed the role of a grants manager in mid-2019 and oversees pre-award and post-award management for early career fellowships in clinical and public health fellowships. So uh, over to you, Madan, to, to, uh, to, to tell us about your career journey. Uh, thank you very much, Lakshmi, for that very kind introduction. Uh, thanks to you, uh, Smita, Shreya, and the entire India Bioscience team for putting together uh, such a wonderful webinar series. Very glad to be part of this and also to be uh, sharing this platform with Ponari. Uh, I hope our audience are all taking good care of themselves during these challenging times and uh, hope uh, webinar fatigue or Zoom fatigue has not set in. Uh, so, uh, before I start, I would like to just add a disclaimer here that I work as a grants manager at India Alliance, but I'm not representing the Alliance uh, in any way uh, in this platform here today. I just like to share uh, my personal views based on uh, my experiences and choices, some of them consciously and meticulously made and some not so much. Uh, and I hope the audience would find it uh, useful in one way or the other. So uh, just very briefly about my uh, career journey or career path uh, so far. Uh, uh, fascination for biology and uh, you know, an interest to study, at, study it at an interface with engineering led me to take uh, BTech biotechnology for my undergraduate course. I did it from PhD Tech Coimbatore from 2003 to seven and um, yeah. So during my uh, BTEC course, I found myself enjoying laboratory sessions a lot and also inspired by my seniors at that time, I was convinced that a PhD is the way forward uh, after a BTEC. So I did send a lot of applications 
to uh, universities abroad, but didn't get through in the first go. This led me to the realization that while my academic credentials and you know, competitive scores were decent, uh, what I was lacking in was um, first-hand research experience uh, because mine was a four-year bachelorate degree and not a master's degree. So I got an opportunity to work as a research assistant at uh, the CCMB in Hyderabad for a couple of years, which gave me my first exposure to uh, you know, planning and executing uh, research, doing experiments in the lab. Uh, this stint very nicely led me to a PhD position at the EMBL Hamburg from 2009 to 13, and I got a very nice opportunity to work on a project that was close to my heart on uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So I was engaged, I was involved in a structural biology project, and while I enjoyed working at the bench, crystallizing proteins, trying to solve structures, looking at them in three-dimensional space, I also realized that maybe active bench research uh, may not be uh, what would excite me in the very long run. Uh, I also realized that uh, relative to research, facilitating research for other people, organizing events such as symposia and workshops, uh, contributing to the management aspects of the lab really appealed to me. And while it was close to the end of my PhD, I did come across uh, uh, openings at India Alliance. And uh, uh, coincidentally, I heard from my friends who uh, you know, uh, passed information about this advertisement to us, uh, advertisement to me and said that the role looks perfectly cut out for me. So I did apply trying to see how the job would look like. And uh, after a few rounds of selection, luckily I got through. And uh, still, even after the job offer was available to me, I was still in a dilemma if, uh, you know, like uh, the crossroad analogy that uh, Smitha was referring to, uh, which path to take. So um, after a lot of discussion, especially a very long conversation with uh, Ponari, with whom I'm sharing the panel today, I was quite convinced that uh, the job profile would be very suitable for my uh, skills, interests, and the values I believe in. And so I decided that I would take the plunge and uh, try, the, uh, try the option of research management for half a year or so, and return back to uh, postdoc uh, offers that were waiting for me in Europe and one in Singapore in case this doesn't uh, work out. But uh, I think fortunately there has been no turning back and here I am at India Alliance uh, six and a half years later. So uh, just very quickly about, uh, about India Alliance for those, of, uh, those in the audience who do not know what India Alliance is. India Alliance is a funding agency which is a visionary partnership between the Department of Biotechnology Government of India and the Wellcome Trust, a UK based charity. Uh, India Alliance invests in transformative research ideas and uh, support, supportive research ecosystems which are aimed at advancing discovery and innovation to improve health. So how we do this is through our very elaborate uh, and generous research funding program, which comprises of fellowships and team science grants and clinical research centers and so on. For those of you who are interested to know more about uh, India Alliance's funding opportunities and the other initiatives that India Alliance is involved in, such as uh, public engagement, science communication training and outreach, please visit uh, the India Alliance's website. There's also a mini site, uh, 10years.indialines.org, which uh, was uh, uh, created specifically to commemorate uh, 10 years of uh, India Alliance since its inception in 2008. So why research management? Uh, Ponari has already covered this to a large extent, but uh, just uh, as a recap, uh, as all of us would agree, uh, research cannot be managed in the same way as it was done, uh, let's say 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, it is becoming increasingly complex. Uh, there is a lot of interdisciplinarity. There is a lot of encouragement for collaborations, both nationally and internationally. And the social awareness levels uh, uh, itself are increasing, which, is, uh, which, which makes it you know, not so trivial or an easy job for researchers to manage their research alongside pursuing their experiments and uh, uh, research questions actively. So this is where research management professionals uh, can come into uh, play. They have a very uh, fair understanding of how uh, research uh, questions are pursued, how research funding works, 
And with this knowledge combined with uh, additional skills, the uh, soft skills, uh, they can contribute to, uh, to, to uh, enhanced impact uh, that researchers are trying to create. So research managers specifically can help uh, researchers in identifying and tapping into sources of funding. Uh, they can help researchers uh, by ensuring that the lab keeps running very smoothly without hiccups. Uh, they can constantly uh, encourage and support innovation because they have, you know, uh, uh, they are or they're expected to have a big picture view of what uh, the, the community requires or the community expects from researchers. Uh, during the process, they can also help to enhance the visibility of the research and help in the management of research uptake in the sense that, uh, you know, they can help in uh, transforming research evidence into policy decisions. They can help in research site take, which means uh, they can help uh, uh, increasing the visibility of science uh, of the research uh, outcomes to the scientific community and also downtake by bridging the science and the society gap and making science accessible to uh, lay audiences as well. So uh, all in all, they could help in supporting and nurturing researchers in the lab and foster their professional growth, or in short, they can make lives much uh, easier for researchers. So uh, very quickly about what a grants advisor at India Alliance does, although I'm going to uh, be speaking about uh, the portfolio of a, a grants advisor at India Alliance. I think the principles would be common uh, and shared for other funding agencies as well. Uh, grants advisors handle a portfolio of grant applications. When I say handle, we uh, play a facilita facilitatory role in uh, making sure that grant applications uh, are in line with administrative requirements and process requirements and are presented in good form for further evaluation by, uh, by the expert uh, reviewers. We carry out processes associated with grant giving activities, which include uh, interacting with the scientific community and making sure substantial review reports are procured on grant applications and thereby support uh, the grant decision-making committees which make uh, funding decisions. So once awards are made, grants advisors also handle a portfolio of grant awards they continue to remain as the single point of contact between uh, the, uh, the grantor, which is the funding agency, and the grantee, who is uh, the beneficiary of the funding, and they help in the administration of the grant for the duration of the award. Uh, they also help in uh, monitoring the progress of uh, uh, the research work over uh, the duration of the award. Uh, at the India Alliance, grants advisors also have the opportunity to contribute to other initiatives of the organization, such as the outreach efforts, science communication training, public engagement activities, and so on, uh, because uh, the scope for you know, these uh, uh, additional activities is also quite wide. So uh, I was working as a grants advisor for, five and, uh, for a good five and a half years before I was uh, given the responsibility of uh, a grants manager. So as grants manager, uh, together with uh, two of my other colleagues, I manage a team of about uh, 15 or 16 grants advisors who uh, carry out pre-award and post-award management of uh, uh, research funding applications and grants. Uh, so managing the team uh, is quite a challenge because uh, you uh, are also expected to constantly monitor if the capacity of the team is right, if the, tra if the team is uh, uh, sufficiently trained and inducted to uh, carry out and uh, carry out the responsibilities and meet the deliverables. So there's a lot of uh, people management skills that would come into play uh, in this part of the work. Uh, as grants manager, I am also accountable for the entire portfolio of grant applications and awards, which means that uh, it is uh, uh, one of my duties uh, with the other managers to make sure that the competition cycle is running as per the timelines and the funding goes out in a timely manner. Uh, for this, there's a lot of liaison with uh, the finance team, the IT team, the operations team, uh, the communications team, and other stakeholders like uh, our funders and the board of trustees. Um, grants manager is also expected to constantly strive to improve processes, policies, and practices. India Alliance is a very uh, fast evolving and response-based organization, so there's a scope, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of freedom and scope 
to constantly improve processes and practices to suit uh, the requirements of the research community at large. Uh, grants manager also makes sure that our processes and uh, you know, our uh, uh, activities are uh, audit compliant and uh, there is accountability at each step of the entire cycle. Uh, we are also involved in identifying and uh, managing risks associated with the, the funding program and its operations uh, at large. So as you can see from this slide uh, and the variety of the verbs there is uh, manage, oversee, layers, improve, ensure, identify. Um, grants advisors and managers uh, have the privilege of wearing these uh, multiple hats as and when required. And that's quite uh, a nice uh, position to be in. So uh, uh, the educational qualifications uh, or, or the requirements would be a strong, broad-based understanding of uh, uh, research and research funding mechanisms. And, and a willingness to work uh, you know, in, in, in a, uh, in a business-like environment, which is closely associated with uh, uh, active academic research in the country. So these are like the essential requirements. In addition, I would say that uh, a set of uh, soft skills would make the life of a research manager much happier. The first on the list for me would be a flair for facilitation. Uh, research managers, uh, uh, for, for want of a better analogy, I would say are in the background facilitating research for, uh, for scientists. And uh, it, it really helps if you have it in you to make it work for other people, to solve problems for other people, and uh, to be able to revel in other people's successes. So uh, that, that I think would be one of the major hallmarks of a happy research manager. Uh, refined interpersonal skills would be important because uh, there is a wide spectrum of stakeholders that research managers would be interacting with, starting from aspirants to applicants to uh, awarded fellows or grantees to uh, you know uh, uh, funders and uh, and uh, communication specialists and so on, and uh, it really helps to have initiative to and liking for both uh, uh, independent work as well as teamwork. Um, it would really help to be open to learning, uh, to unlearning and relearning as and when uh, the, uh, the situation demands, because uh, as a profession, this is, uh, is it's quite new and evolving and uh, there is a scope for a lot of innovation. So an openness to kind of leave your baggage behind, unlearn and relearn would really help. Uh, attention to detail, tremendous attention to detail would also be important because you're dealing with a lot of uh, uh, finances, a lot of uh, uh, research data and, uh, and applications. So uh, tremendous attention to detail while also managing large workloads and working to tight deadlines. So I, won uh, I once had a colleague who said the, that the most exciting part of the job is to see or to hear the whooshing sound of a deadline pass by. So uh, if you are interested or if you like that kind of uh, uh, challenging work environment, I think uh, research management is one of the options. So um, the challenges and perks of uh, uh, being involved in research management, uh, like I said, this is a nascent field and uh, career paths and trajectories are beginning to set, get set uh, only now. And uh, uh, much more than before, there is a strong realization of the importance of a research management uh, profession and the community in India is being very strongly felt now. Uh, but it would take time uh, for uh, the profession to be uh, as evolved as it is, for example, in the West. Uh, because of this, there are associated challenges as well. There is a lot of inertia in the system as such, uh, uh, not in all sections, but in a few sections where uh, people still would require time to get used to new ways of working and, uh, and seeing the, uh, the value and significance that uh, research management as a profession can bring in. And because of this, there's also often weekly demarcated roles and job descriptions, uh, which can sometimes be a little confusing. But again, like Ponari was hinting, this can be looked at as, as a challenge and rather, uh, rather than a demerit. And uh, 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 it, it, there's a lot of opportunity for people to tailor make uh, careers uh, depending on their skills and interests. There are, of course, a lot of perks. 
uh, I would like to classify them or put them under two broad categories. One is uh, there is uh, a lot of intellectual stimulation. Although you're not doing active research yourself, you are in constant touch with uh, the cutting edge uh, research and technology in the country and the who's who of uh, uh, research in the country. And based on the variety of interactions you have, uh, the type of uh, problems you can uh, contribute to solving, there's a lot of uh, intellectual stimulation. And for me specifically more than that, I think the emotional gratification factor is, uh, is quite uh, comforting. Uh, it, it is uh, immensely gratifying to see a research problem uh, take, sh take shape in the form of a research proposal, pass through different stages of uh, scrutiny and then finally emerge into this beautiful research proposal that gets funded and uh, results come out and get published. And there's also a lot of emotional gratification associated with the job when you speak to aspirants or young uh, colleagues who, who would like to know more about the profession, uh, who would like to get more training uh, in science communication uh, and other aspects. So uh, a little bit about the opportunities that are available. I would say that opportunities available with funding agencies are uh, are fewer than it than would be available at uh, research institutions and universities at this uh, point in time, uh, but but trends are changing and we don't know what a post COVID world would present. Uh, so uh, increased research funding would only mean that there would there would be an increased requirement of research prof professionals to handle funding. So so uh, the hope is that uh, much more opportunities would open up. Uh, one can start looking at. Uh, uh, options that government bodies like DBT, DST, or ICMR would provide. Uh, I should add here that uh, there are not uh, frequently there are not uh, set positions or clear cut roles, and uh, sometimes positions open up uh, on an ad hoc basis in terms of interns or uh, in terms of uh, program associates. But uh, uh, there are opportunities which come up uh, from time to time. Uh, one might also want to look at philanthropic organizations such as the Tata Trust and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to see if uh, the ethos and the values of such organizations resonate with their uh, organization, uh, with, with their own values and see if there are opportunities for, uh, uh, for contributing in, in places like this. There are also other agencies like India Alliance, the German Exchange uh, uh, Agency, the DAD, uh, British Council, etc. Uh, DAD and British Council, even if there are not many uh, research funding programs, there are also a lot of efforts happening towards education uh, scholarship. So there might be possibilities of, uh, uh, you know, management positions opening at these places as well. So um, I would also say that a first starting step, a very good starting step for anybody interested in research management uh, would be to look up uh, IRMI or India Research Management Initiative which uh, is an initiative that was started by India Alliance in 2018 with, uh, with a pilot phase uh, aimed at uh, understanding the research management uh, ecosystem in the country, what the gaps are, and uh, collecting baseline data about uh, you know, what kind of systems can be put in place and what the, what the, uh, what the gaps in the research management ecosystem are. And uh, based on the pilot phase, uh, uh, IRMI has also started a five-year phase where uh, India Alliance is giving out research management grants and research management fellowships, which I think are one of a kind in the country. So uh, people who are interested can look up uh, India Alliance Research Management Initiative. You can also register for the uh, IRMI newsletter, IRMI bulletin, and uh, opportunities that open up uh, uh, in, in any field, uh, in any uh, aspect of research management are generally uh, uh, publicized through the IRMI mailing list. Uh, people who'd like to get training uh, online to see what skills they can add to can also look up Coursera. There are uh, many online courses which uh, can help directly or indirectly to uh, strengthen skills that would, be, uh, would make a person a better research manager. There is NQRA, which is uh, the National Council of University Research Administrators, which is based in the US. They also have an online learning platform. 
the ARMA, which is the Association of Research Managers and Administrators in the UK, also have a very robust uh, online uh, learning platform, which offers a lot of uh, online uh, training opportunities. So these are some areas uh, which uh, people who are interested uh, can uh, sign up to and look up uh, for more information. So I'm almost at the end of my presentation. Uh, so how does one start, uh, you know, if they kind of have an indication that research management is something that they would like to be involved in, uh, in the short, medium or long term? Uh, of course, uh, make an evaluation of your values, interests, skills, and some inherent traits, which uh, you think might uh, come in handy for, for such a role. Uh, if you're not sure where to start, you can also look up myidp.sciencecareers.org, which is a web-based platform, which uh, I think administers uh, free exercises, which help you identify your interests and skills, and can also give you indications uh, for different career options, what could be a suitable career options for you uh, in the STEM uh, field. Uh, I would also advise that ask you yourself again and again if you have the right reasons to make a switch to research management. If you think research is difficult and frustrating and you have the fear of rejection that your manuscripts might not get accepted and the field is too competitive, uh, I wouldn't say that's a, very comp uh, that's a very compelling reason to make a switch to research management because research management also has its own, uh, uh, you know, uh, stress stress and um, frustration factors. So only if you have it in you to, uh, you know, uh, facilitate research for others and uh, while staying uh, closely associated with active research, maybe uh, you could uh, uh, explore the possibilities. I would also urge, uh, especially our younger audiences to uh, rewrite the CV. As bachelors, masters, and PhD students, we are trained to write our CVs in a certain way and we only mm -hmm. highlight our academic achievements. But if you're planning to make a switch to a management related career, you might want to uh, introspect and identify, identify your strengths that would make a CV much more appealing for such a role. Uh, another piece of personal advice I would like to give is Whatever stage your career you are in, if you have an opportunity to organize an event, be it online, offline uh, event, please grab it and uh, put in the best efforts to organize events. There is a lot of learning and a lot of uh, interpersonal skill building uh, while you organize events. Uh, last but not the least, uh, be proactive and strengthen your professional network. Uh, cannot emphasize this enough. So it's okay to feel a little bit shy at the beginning, but please do not uh, uh, hesitate to ask questions, to reach out and uh, have your uh, doubts cleared, discuss with people. Even if they're not able to give you answers, they might be able to lead you to the correct resources. Just, so just please be open to discussion. So I think I'll stop there and thank everyone for your attention. And I would be happy to uh, get in touch uh, or be contacted through email or on Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madan. That was a very good overview of the resource ecosystem and, and a lot of good advice and recommendations. I'm sure the students would find it useful. So I'm not going to stand between the attendees and the panelists. So we'll open the floor to questions. But before we do that, I'm, I'm just going to tell you if any of you want to ask your questions live to the panelists, you can do so. And in order to do so, just raise that hand, that virtual hand that you see at the bottom of your screen. And when I see your hands raised, I'm going to allow you to talk. I see your hand raised. And you'll see host is allowing you to talk. When you see that, immediately unmute yourself and ask the questions. Please keep your questions brief so that we'll get as many people to ask questions. Mukund, you can unmute yourself and talk. Hello. We can hear you. Go ahead question, with your question, Mukund. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Thank you, uh, uh, the whole panel members, for this wonderful session. It was really uh, uh, what to say, as a science candidate, I am pursuing a B.Tech final year in biotechnology from Anna University, Chennai. So, I am at the crossroads right now. Uh, I had a PhD offer from the USA, but I didn't take it up because I had uh, the academic experience that you people were talking that I might not like it. Uh, the academic, the hardcore academic experience. I love the research part, but not the academic part of it. 
uh, I would like to direct this question to both of you is that uh, why do people get stuck in the, the, the normal academic path, the linear academic path that is the postdoc, the mini postdocs and then a, a tenure track which is very difficult to find and it's really uh, the motivation keeps, it just falls down in the academic part, right? So, but the job part, as you said, it is not, uh, it's not very like, uh, what to say, like in IT field, you don't have many jobs for PhD candidates. Like, uh, you can't get a transition into an industry. It is very difficult for a PhD candidate to transition into an industry, be it an, uh, a, management, a managing part like yours. So, how is the trend of biology? So, uh, Smita, yeah. No, no, no. Let, let Mother Norpunari answer this. Mother, would you like to take it up? Yeah. So, um, uh, I think you, you're making very valid points, Mukund. Uh, academic positions are... Uh, very scarce and uh, data has shown us that uh, uh, very few uh, academic positions compared to the number of graduates, uh, PhD graduates, the country churns out uh, every year. Uh, so uh, my suggestion to you would be to look for, uh, you know, first see if uh, this is the main reason for you to uh, give up on academic research. I should say that despite rejections, despite the few, very scarce opportunities that are available for an academic career path, if uh, the, the excitement of making a new discovery and uh, being the first in the world to do it, uh, if that means a lot to you, that matters a lot to you, you should uh, stay on an academic research career path and see if uh, you can go forward with it. But if you still maybe enjoy research, but do not want to get into the academic stream, which is like a, a little more established because we have a lot of role models to follow. Maybe you could look at um, uh, research in the industry and uh, or some teaching positions which would offer you uh, a little bit of scope to do research uh, alongside your teaching. So it really uh, would boil down to what you enjoy doing uh, because opportunities are scarce in whatever field uh, you, uh, you name it. So it would really mean, uh, it would really be important to narrow down on your skills and interests, what would motivate you and what, you, what would, uh, you know, uh, keep you, uh, uh, what would uh, uh, be more enjoyable for you uh, in the long run. I don't know if, if that answered your question, but uh, I don't know if Ponari would like to add here. No, I think you've nailed it, Madan. Yeah, like, I mean, like all the panelists have been saying, I think what is important is to uh, basically do that introspection and find out what is it that matters to you the most. I mean, what is it that you enjoy doing and then take a decision based on that. Um, and uh, just one point that I would like to mention that um, uh, you can make these career transitions at any stage. You can do it before PhD, you can do it after PhD also. So, you know, uh, it's uh, entirely up to you when you want to do that career transition based on a number of factors, uh, you know, and uh, like Shreya so nicely pointed out, do the exercise and, you know, see what, uh, uh, try to see where you fit in and, you know, what interests you and take a decision based on that. Thank you both. Um, lots of hands raised. I'm going to uh, allow you to, uh, uh, Niveda Murali Shankar, please keep your questions concise so we can hear as many voices. Niveda, unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, amazing piece of information that you both gave. So I'm, I've also done my BTEC uh, from Anna University, affiliated university. And uh, I've got an admit in Germany for master's in regenerative biology and medicine. So I've worked in ISC for like one year where I've done some research and I got good experience. But I, as you said, I noted that I really like organization of events. I've been part of organizing the conferences and all. So science and uh, the you know management part really interests me so the question which i had was after doing a master's can you actually you know switch track into a management position like you know a research management or is it really necessary to take the next level to go to a phd and and then to you know consider uh, moving into a management role can't you do that uh, right after masters 
Yeah, so I think this this question uh, is uh, has uh, led to a lot of debate in the community whether a PhD is important for a research management position, and there are very differing views from uh, different people about whether or not a PhD is important. Uh, my take on that would be that uh, you know uh, if you have a broad based understanding of uh, research, and even during your masters, if you have uh, uh, built on your management skills, if you're proactively sought uh, training and built on these skills, uh, it should be fine because uh, many research management positions do not uh, require you to have a strong uh, publication record or uh, an accomplished research career trajectory. Having said that, it would also depend on the position you're seeking to apply. For example, a grants advisor position at India Alliance uh, it is a prerequisite that a PhD, uh, the candidate has a PhD. So it would really depend on the level of the position that you're applying to and the requirements of the position. Uh, I would also like to add that uh, the PhD, in addition to uh, scientific and technical training, it uh, brings in a lot of other aspects for an all round development of an individual uh, as somebody who can appreciate science and facilitate science. Uh, for example, project management skills, uh, efficient documentation skills, time management skills, uh, uh, people management skills. Uh, these are some things that uh, PhD students unconsciously or subconsciously pick up during the PhD tenure. So uh, it, it really depends on the kind of position you're looking for and what you aim to get out of your PhD or your master's. Thank you, Madan. Perhaps, Shreya, can we take a question from the Q&A box? Sure, uh, Lakshmi. So something that uh, many of our attendees uh, seem to be interested in is that given the current situation with COVID and pandemic and the break that that has ensured, how do you think that will affect the career progression of somebody, let's say, who's interested in grants management right now? So either of you, I know it's a difficult question. So either of you can take this. Uh, yeah, I can, I, I let me attempt. Uh, if I've understood the question correctly. So I'm talking from my uh, perspective as, as, as a research, as a grants manager at an institution. Uh, see, most of the work that you do as a grants manager, uh, you can very well accomplish it sitting at home, you know, working on your computer, um, you know, talking over telephone. Um, so. If you've already taken up that position, then I would say that it is not going to matter much. You would be able to continue to do uh, accomplish all your uh, responsibilities quite efficiently. If you're asking whether uh, finding a job like this during this COVID situation uh, is going to be dif difficult, then again, I would say that uh, I don't think so. I think actually more and more people are now realizing the importance of uh, science and research um, and therefore, uh, hopefully, there is going to be more funding for science and more such positions will open up. Uh, after the COVID situation started, I have seen at least, uh, you know, two, three positions advertised for uh, research managers at institutions. And, uh, you know, there are multiple positions being advertised uh, in incubation centers and, you know, technology transfer offices and places like that. So I uh, actually think uh, we'll be okay. Great. Uh, thank you, Bunari. Uh, one more question. This has been asked specifically to Madan uh, from the Q&A box. And that is, did you face a reverse culture shock when you moved away from academia or when you moved back from the US? And how has that affected your career trajectory? Uh, I did face, uh, I moved back from uh, Germany and not the US. I did face a reverse cultural shock uh, outside uh, work environment, but I, at the work environment, I didn't face it that much because uh, at the India Alliance, uh, all processes are uh, done, are carried out with a great deal of transparency and uh, at par with uh, international standards as far as uh, research funding and uh, management goes. So there was not that much of a reverse cultural shock at the workplace. So I think I was in a lucky position to uh, be, uh, associated with India Alliance right after my PhD. Thanks. And I think uh, 
Lakshmi, I think the next question will be taking live. So we'll have uh, we'll take a live question from Satya Prakash Pandey. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Satya Prakash, yeah. yes, please ask your question. Yeah, first I would like to thank uh, India Bioscience for this great panel and all the all the inputs, especially Shreya for that skill, interest, and values part. I think that is very helpful. So my question is that. Uh, how how should one go about transitioning into this kind of career? Like Madan pointed out that he kept the options open for postdocs and other opportunities before he transitions into it. And that's like kind of a fail-safe mechanism also that maybe I would like it, maybe I would not like it. So even if one has a flair for, flair for uh, facilitating research, uh, there are a lot of other other things also come into the picture. So how should, uh, should one go like a freelancing or like a short into this uh, career path and then uh, transition gradually or should one directly take a leap of faith and then get into it? Okay. So I think uh, both me and Madan have done it very differently. So I think Madan uh, kept his options open maybe because he didn't know whether he was ready to make that transition or not. Uh, whereas in my case, I knew very, uh, I was very sure that I was uh, going to step out of academia and try something else. So again, I think it is more or less, it depends on, you know, on, on your personality and how you would like to look at it. Um, in terms of freelancing opportunities, um, those are not very easy to come by in uh, research management. Uh, so uh, once you have the experience in a research management role, then you could freelance perhaps because you've shown that, you know, you have the, you have what it takes to become a good research manager, but to freelance, uh, at the beginning might be a little difficult, actually. Uh, so I would say, you know, like I've been saying in my talk also, don't be afraid to, you know, to experiment, to try it out. And then, you know, if you don't like it, uh, uh, you know, there are other options. So that would be my personal advice, um, unless Madan wants to add anything. Yeah. Uh, so if, thanks, Punari. So I would like to say that in some, in many cases, there might not be something very, uh, you know, very suitable waiting for you in the form of an internship or a freelancing opportunity. So by all means, get in touch with the agency or the organization that you think you would like to work for and try and uh, negotiate with them, pitch in an idea, uh, how your skill set uh, and how your interests might benefit them and see if there is an opportunity uh, that you can pursue uh, for a short to medium term. Uh, if, if there is a match, uh, well, well and good, you can try, try that. But all I'm trying to say is uh, it might not be readily available. There might be a little bit of negotiation, a little bit of uh, uh, conversation, dialogue for you to get involved in, even to identify opportunities and to nurture them uh, and to tailor them to your uh, skill sets and interests. So, so a little bit of proactive effort from your side might help. Great. Uh, thanks. I guess we are running quite over over time, but uh, it's it's a great discussion going on, and that's how uh, we thought. Let's let's take a little more time. So, uh, uh, thanks, Punari and Madan, for this amazing overview uh, about your career journeys, and uh, we've been talking about these transitions and you know some set paths and these different career roles so uh this is another question that i have uh, i guess i have my understanding clear but uh, just for the sake of the audience i would request both of you to talk about uh, this distinction which is out there in the system about mainstream and alternate career paths now that there are so many avenues open up do we really need to tag them uh, like this? Uh, do we do justice by tagging them alt mainstream and alternate? So uh, over to you, Madan and Punari. You want I to think, first Yeah, I think yeah, already Madan. many, many forums, many platforms, people have consciously started avoiding the usage of the word alternate and right. uh, started calling them as non-academic careers in science, which I think is a better way to address it. Uh, because like I said earlier, looking at the numbers of uh, uh, graduates who eventually end up in academic uh, research leadership positions, 
that actually is the alternate career in science, I would say, and the others are uh, are much more in number. So uh, I'm I'm all for uh, not using or tagging it as an alternate career, whatever it is, it management, uh, illustration, communication, public engagement, policy. These are not alternate careers anymore. Thanks, Panari. Um, Yes, I completely agree. I think all of these roles are becoming very, very integral to science uh, internationally and also in the country. We need science communicators, we need research managers, you know, we need uh, facilitators, we need people to go out there and connect with uh, uh, connect science to people. So all of these are very mainstream and very essential for science in the country now. So I uh, agree that, uh, uh, you know, uh, careers, uh, besides academia or non-academic science careers is probably uh, the right way to uh, refer these. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, over to you, Lakshmi. Well, thank you all for this uh, really engaging discussion. I know we've gone over that's only because you've all been uh, extremely engaging. And uh, we've got many, many questions, about over 100 questions we wouldn't be uh, unfortunately having time to address all of these in this webinar, but but not to worry, uh, we will probably create a FAQ resource uh, that addresses you know common themes that have arisen out of these uh, discussion. Uh, so so we will come to uh, to a close uh, with this webinar. So I would like to make a few announcements. Um, we would love to, of course, hear from you, uh, you for your feedback. As soon as this webinar gets over, you'll see a feedback form pop up on your screens. Please use that form while you're fresh with experience to let us know about this event. And you know, uh, if you like this, definitely save your spot for the next uh, Crafting Your Career session, which will be on researching career options. Uh, the link to that also will be shared shared with you. Uh, so with that, we we will say goodbye for now, but. Definitely stay safe during these times and see you soon.